In a recent video I did on ADHD, I shared about how bad my functioning was around the age of 20, right before I started to do my own childhood trauma work. And I talked about how I could never really get it together in the way that I wanted to. I was late for everything. I was somewhat dissociated in say, just basic talking with people. Was never really on top of my bills. Had some magical thinking going on, like thinking I can get across town in five minutes when it really takes 45. And I had this constant nagging sense that I was defective and really somewhat wasn't gonna make it in life. Um, I was also impulsive with money, constantly behind the eight ball, and pretty much kind of a mess. Um, and many of you really resonated with my description of all that or for how I was in the world at that time. And an interesting piece um, that is the main point to this video is I, I couldn't really meditate until I did some work around my childhood trauma, which is interesting. As much as I tried, I couldn't get to a calm, focused place in order to do that, and I want to come back to that later. I wanted to go into deeper about what specifically in my childhood trauma, what was it that made my functioning that off that got better through treatment? Um, in my first two or three years of private practice, I saw my clients struggle with the same things that I struggled with, like distraction, dysregulation, general adulting, um, and many would lose their focus and not having the confidence about relying on themselves for general living, just like my experience, like something was preventing them from getting there. And I started to call that thing simply trauma noise. Trauma noise is the cumulative unprocessed events, emotions, grief, shame, injustice, um, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, family dynamics, stuff that we saw all of it and some of it's conscious but actually most of it isn't and i see it as repressed but i still think it runs our system even though that it's repressed trauma noise is like having a bunch of songs being played at the same time in your head or in our subconscious and it's not a cool mashup it's not a good time uh, you know none of it's in tune none of it's lined up and the brain is overwhelmed with dealing with trying to manage all that while still functioning or pretending that it's not there and that part is exhausting. One song is say your parents divorce, another is the relationship that you had with one of them, um, one is what happened to you or to your siblings, one is the things you said or did growing up because you were traumatized, another is a, is a specific collection of things that happened such as bullying inside or outside the home. And all of that is on repeat in our subconscious playing at once. Um, sometimes quiet and sometimes really cranked up when we're triggered, like one song will then take precedence when we say we get feedback or work or we're triggered to intimacy with our partner. And I think they're on repeat because they're asking to be processed like how we have spe specific recurring dreams or images from time to time. And we're just trying to do life with all that going on, just trying to make it through work or navigate relationships or simply to just get through our day. Also, this isn't me trying to like freak you out or gaslight you about feeling that you're worse off than you are. Of course this stuff is there and you've actually managed to deal with it so far um, and you're okay. I just want you to have a, a stronger understanding of your triggers and stuck places related to this concept in context and not confusing it with ADHD. And as a side note, deep process Processing of childhood trauma isn't for everybody and that should be respected. Sometimes it is best to just leave it be and function as best as you can. That should be respected. So I'd like to give some specific examples of trauma noise in this video and look at how they often get confused with ADHD in my mind. Here are some major bullet points about this video, just like the last one I did on this topic, which was ADHD versus CPTSD. Number one is, in no way am I discounting the diagnosis of ADHD. Number two is I'm giving the framework for adults with ADHD symptoms or trauma symptoms, not children. I'm not suggesting that ADHD is always caused by trauma. And I'm what I am saying is CPTSD can often be misdiagnosed for ADHD because they look so similar that the major deciding factor would be a person's history of childhood trauma, which is complicated because some don't remember. So I get that part. Um, in the last video, the message is you certainly can have 
TPTSD and ADHD both going on. And doing therapy work for either can be very much helpful. So it's, it's all okay. I see in the mental health world though that we don't consider childhood trauma enough and it's usually glossed over. So I'm offering another possibility as in my history, the more I worked deeply in my childhood trauma, the higher my capacity for functioning was and just getting out of my own way. If you're new to me or new to the channel, welcome. If you like this video, feel free to hit some buttons on the screen. You can't miss with any of the buttons, especially the like button or the subscribe button. Greatly contributes to the community around this channel that's focused on childhood trauma. And if these videos are helpful to you and to your recovery, you can consider supporting the work that goes into this channel over at my Patreon. I've added a new tier on the Patreon where you can pay a higher amount to get a monthly live Q&A with me every Wednesday once a month. That's done over Zoom. In addition, you can go to my website to check out some childhood trauma e-course work that I offer there. Also, if you are a resident of North Carolina and Massachusetts, my practice is now offering childhood trauma groups and where we're interviewing for those groups when these the, the folks running it are trainees of mine who have done their own work. Unfortunately, due to licensing requirements, we're only offering them at the in those states at this time. So if you're in North Carolina or Massachusetts, hit me up through my website if you're interested. Um, and if you're a therapist, life coach, or holistic practitioner, you can join me for a live training that I'm doing on inner child work and childhood trauma on Saturday, May 7th, 2022. Registration is right up there on my white ball to my website. So the best way I can share this idea of trauma noise is through a visual. As childhood trauma survivors, we're all sitting on a lot and trying to just do our best in life. We're trying to show up to our relationships or our children or our careers or just trying to be just trying to be a person. Either when we're activated or triggered in some ways or whether we're just at our baseline emotions, these things still affect our functioning because the noise is still there. It just might not be on full volume like when we're triggered. And I don't believe that the things that we're sitting on go away as much as we try to rep either repress it, deny it, or ignore it. I think trauma comes out sideways when we try to push it down. It comes out in other ways. Um, and I look at trauma noise as a collective of what happened to us and that becomes our conditioning. Here's what I mean. The noise consists of unprocessed things like our core beliefs that come from childhood trauma, examples being I'm unlovable, if people disrespect me, they should be punished, I'll never have what others have, it's my job to take care of others. These are developed during our survival of, of childhood trauma to make sense of what's going on around us. The second piece is unprocessed incidents, scenes from childhood that pop up in our minds or in our dreams subconsciously. They can also come in the forms of fighting with people in our heads, like I've mentioned, and not connecting the present fight in our heads to stuff that came up in childhood. Um, these are all, this is all the abuse that happened to us or stuff that we saw as children, anything from being abused by a sibling to seeing uh, a sibling get abused by somebody else. The third thing is our history of traumatized Self. Raise your hand out there if you've been trying to go to sleep and your brain decides to randomly focus on what you said in the eighth grade <laughs> that one time and kind of made a fool out of yourself or when you actually weren't really good to another kid for trying to fit in or things that you said or did to somebody that you, you know that when you were dating. We're all human but I find that those who grow up in in trauma, they act out because of the parental trauma. And then we feel like we're terrible humans. We were giving off these signs. It's not what we would have chosen to behave like that, even if we were safe at home or grew up in normalcy. And the fourth piece is big. It's family legacy and shame. I really think that most of our unconscious behaviors and stuff comes from trying to not be like our parents, one or both of them. So when when the when your debit card gets declined for whatever reason and the trauma noise kind of pops up and takes over, and it, it kind of takes the opportunity to pop up and say, see, you're just like your mooching father, or you're just like your manipulative mother, and everyone can see, or you can't hide that you're you're just like them about money or that you know see mom and dad were right about you you can't manage things that's what I mean by that that family legacy all of these are examples 
um, can look like someone struggling with ADHD in the moment. So let's do a hypothetical on that credit card idea. So you can see the trauma survivor really get disorganized and dissociate, say, about the credit card thing being declined at a lunch or store or whatever. But then they stay in that and then they become late for work because they get consumed in it or because they get reactive and then they overly take several hours to go over every piece of their finances to make sure. And now they're in a hyper focus place about it. And they might go down the rabbit hole of sorts after confirming that the, the simply the credit card actually expired and they actually had the money in there, but they're so triggered about the shame of it that it takes over. And I see going down the rabbit hole as becoming hypervigilant due to shame. And yes, a credit card decline is difficult for anyone or someone with ADHD, but it taking over throughout our days might be a sign of something greater like childhood trauma. So that's what I mean about trauma noise. And yes, it means that you're triggered in the moment, but the noise is consistently there and now it's just louder when we're activated. So let's l briefly look at a Venn diagram from that video I mentioned about comparing ADHD to CPTSD. So here are the traditional ADHD symptoms on the left, things like poor planning, poor time management, task completion, hyperactivity, or problems with hyperfocus, and compared to traditional CPTSD symptoms on the right. We also have the majority of named issues in the strong overlap of the Venn diagram, with the main idea in those two issues, in my mind, heavily rooted in something called dissociation. I'll have the link to this video description that you guys can check out at the end, so you can just go check out what that video was about. I think we dissociate because of the trauma noise where we lose being present in the moment. And the card thing will automatically put us into a disorganized, activated brain, and we lose our groundedness. We lose our goodness about ourselves, that so we're still a good person even though the credit card came up. And we lose a foundation, and that's how I see dissociation. It's not just an out-of-body experience. So, and I think that all of these words and definitions on the diagram are better explained in someone's personal story instead of concepts, such as the CPTSD symptom of, say, attachment problems. I think it's better explained by someone's story, like from that trauma noise slide about having, say, a physically abusive mother and an abandoning father who has multiple affairs. That's the reason for the attachment stuff, not just the name of it. Um, this might become, say, an avoidant attachment style in adulthood, the push-pull style that can be confused with ADHD symptoms around communication or confusion about what the person might really want from a relationship. And such attachment problems, for example, create a lot of noise in our head from our lives that affect our functioning and our ability to be present in the way that we would want to be. You know, raise your hand out there if you've ever gotten really reactive with someone that you were dating with and kind of blew it. Um, did that come from like no, like a nowhere place inside of you? Like it, did it come from a place that was on automatic pilot? That's pretty noisy where the trauma is coming out sideways as much as we try to maybe repress it or simply that we're not aware of it. And we can we could also easily attribute that to like the impulsivity or disorganization around ADHD. So I'm going to present four examples from traditional ADHD symptoms, not all of them. And we'll look at them through the lens of childhood trauma and CPTSD because the symptoms, they, they look very similar. And these are not numbered in order and many of them will overlap, it usually does. Um, and it's okay if you relate to all of them and I'm just doing some of the major ADHD symptoms and not all of them. Just want to highlight what I mean when I go through some. So let's just dive into it. Number one, poor planning, poor follow through, prioritization, and organization. This is kind of a hodgepodge of, of several ADHD symptoms here. So getting work projects done, cleaning up a room, getting lost in it, finishing a paper on time or needing extensions because of that or procrastinating right up to the wire. That's kind of actually how I, I, I operate in sort of procrastination. It's not always a bad thing. It's just my process. So take that for what it is. Or even getting back to people in text and email, sort of drowning in a pile of basic living tasks and overwhelm simply about stuff like travel plans. And it's totally in line with the diagnosis of ADHD. And if the person doesn't have a trauma history, perfectly fine to just leave it at that and seek treatment for ADHD. But what if all that pile up and overwhelm is due to a person growing up and say neglect 
or growing up in incredible shame around, say, coming from a looks good on paper family that lives for performance and expectations or executing tasks and you're scapegoated and failure to measure up into that. Or if you grew up something like the chaos family where there's really no parenting around getting it together. I often say that children growing up in toxic systems um, are expected to be amazing and self-sufficient little adults without getting any help. Kids need a lot of help. If you're a parent now, you probably get that. And what if the functioning and disorganization is trauma noise rooted in the core belief that you don't measure up because that was verbatim said to you and your inner child is just acting accordingly with what your family thought about you? What if this, and this is a common one, is part of it is not being able to get out of your own way with this kind of functioning because you literally were never parented by a safe person around organization or showing up what you were expected to. Children of neglect live in anxiety and overwhelm because life is all on them. That's a very important concept. As young as grammar school, the child doesn't even know that healthy parents consistently help with living um, and learning and setting the child up for success. Like say a third grader, um, a healthy parent would say, remember we had that school project with the diorama on nature this week. Instead of parents not knowing about it or caring or worse, reacting that it comes up last minute. Um, like the kid should handle all that when that's not how parenting really works. At least that's how I see it. Are the problems of follow through really about being set up by the parental figures about not being prepared or engaged in life? Where in extreme neglect, we have really off expectations. This is where children actually show signs of like grades failing or acting out, but they aren't seen as signs to do something for the child, but they're rather seen as the child's failings. The inner child might also be waiting still for someone to show them how to live, how to get their credit score out of the red, how to donate clothes that they no longer wear, teaching to have like some flow in life. That's a deep version of noise, um, and it can also look like protesting life subconsciously. So it's really important, like you're watching this video, which is an act of trying to get your adult in place to take care of the inner child. Overwhelm is the noise of like a hundred thoughts usually going off in the negative all at once. Pay attention to the quality of those thoughts. Are they about catastrophe? Are they about fear of not knowing how to do something or doing something well? Are they about feeling like the basic thing that you need to do is like insurmountable and you just can't do it? Are they about giving up maybe due to grief? And lastly, many clients become frozen. I wanna make sure I address this one around decisions. Decision making can really mess us up. Simple decisions are big ones. And I think it's due from all the trauma noise that I mentioned about what's gonna happen if I pull the trigger on this decision. Number two is communication. In my mind, communication is the biggest manifestation of trauma noise that looks like ADHD. I find a major place of discomfort for trauma survivors is being seen, um, talking on Zoom, talking at a meeting, talking in class, any hint of shame or conflict that comes up socially um, with people can really dysregulate us and feel like we're on the spot. So examples of being seen, explaining ourselves to say a new therapist, um, being sung happy birthday to, I know that that sounds weird, but you're the focus, having to present or discuss something in class at work, being introduced to new people. For survivors, this creates anxiety and like frenetic energy that is difficult to explain. So what does this look like? It might look like tripping over our words, talking while filtering way too much due to shame and not wanting to offend somebody or come across wrong, maybe like our parents do, navigating the listener way too much, losing our thoughts or our points, becoming super tangential, apologizing or navigating someone as we go. Um, it's the opposite of being calm and comfortable and direct. You know, and how could that actually be trauma noise? Well, abused children are often put on the spot. In fact, we all, we only do this to children. Like, look at me when I'm talking to you, or I can't believe that you would ask that right now. And how dare you say that about your father? Or you always get things wrong, you know, or spit it out for F sakes. Communicating was often terrifying in the abusive family system. So there's gonna be a lot of noise in the present about how the other person will see us, how the other person will react. Um, we also witness a lot of the adults communicating in really off ways or nasty ways, and we don't wanna be like them. 
um, but we don't really have healthy ideas or role models to go on, so we're just kind of winging it. The big thing with trauma noise is also blurting things out in some form of a truth we want to say, but it comes out in really insensitive ways or really awkward ways. And we were probably actually raised like that, and the inner children are stuck in trying to tell the truth, but don't know how to do it in healthy ways. This can be mislabeled as ADHD communication when it might not be. Um, are we interrupting a conversation because of ADHD, or is it because we're doing that from trying to control what other people think about us due to shame, um, just like we had to do with our parents or control people's reactions? Could it be related to not seeing healthy reciprocity in conversations at home? I had a boss one time that constantly misread what I was saying. They would interrupt me and give me like an airtight argument on something totally unrelated to what I was expressing. It was kind of maddening actually. But I also knew that they grew up in a very dominating, gotta win the conversation family system. Like it's like, you're not gonna shame me this time and I'm gonna prove it to you why. Like that was their relational style. And navigating and filtering ourselves can also be the noise of shame as well as the noise of a parent constantly misunderstanding you or giving you constantly like little quips. These are these are really gross when parents do this. It's like, of course you wanna sleep over your friend's house because you can't stand being at home. I was never like that when I was a kid. Why are you? That's what I mean by that. So we try to control and navigate that. So if you find yourself navigating others and losing track, like, well, well, of course you don't want tomatoes and you told me that a long time ago. I was just not thinking, I'm sorry, but you have the right to change your mind. I'm I'm not like imposing my will here about the tomatoes though. We, we don't even have to have the pasta. We could do anything you want. All of them is like, I'm trying to cover up a time bomb and we communicate in weird, weird ways because of that. It's kind of how I grew up as well. Moving on num to number three is impulsivity. Um, strongly related to number two about communication. This can range from a busy internal motor to rushing through things, interrupting others in conversation, misinterpreting someone and reacting to your own narrative, um, not having reciprocity, like I mentioned in conversations, fidgeting. This can also look like kind of being in an attention seeking mode, like you're acting like a bit of a court gesture impulsively. It can also look like acting without thinking, like you're at a party and you, all of a sudden you decide to start cleaning up during kind of a chill time because you don't know what else to do with yourself. You're acting without thinking or not thinking of consequences, like say calling in sick too many times and being detached from my, what, what might happen because of that or how it, that might come across. And again, even if you don't have a trauma history, all of these can definitely just fall under ADHD. And either way though, these result in us not really feeling good about ourselves or how we conducted. Like you leave the party and you're like, why was I cleaning, you know? Um, this can even look like misreading suggestions and misreading them as commands or demands, like your partner is asking to do something together, but you're busy and you become like angry or pressured internally. That's impulsively reacting to a suggestion or missing the point where like you actually can sort of say no or reschedule or engage better with them. Or worse, you you know, not to take the outing and, and overstress yourself and trying to do both work and the outing at the same time and then you act out from that. So how could all that be potential trauma noise? Well, remember the disassociative part of that overlapping Venn diagram? That can mean being out of our bodies, but it can also mean being really unconscious and not grounded in ourselves and we react instead of respond. It can also mean being impulsive like the squeaky wheel in class seeking attention. It can mean being a bit self-involved and not seeing the other person in a conversation. It can mean making on the spot poor decisions like cracking a joke or making a reference that only you'll get, then feeling bad when it doesn't land. These are all things we can kind of feel shame about or even leave a class or conversation being worried if you monopolize the conversation but didn't intend to, like it was automatic. How could that be related to childhood trauma? Well, growing up in neglect 
or a super tense environment where things weren't modeled in healthy ways or the mirroring was really off. Many survivors um, grow up in what I call kind of vacuums and they don't know how they come across to others. We're also the last to know if we're reactive or impulsive kind of relationally. So raise your hand if you feel like you didn't get the handbook in life on how to be social as a kid or it started there and you kept making awkward attempts. This feels like you're kind of shooting in the dark but yet intuiting it's going to fail anyway but yet you still do it. Like think Ralph Wiggum from The Simpsons kind of a vibe. And sure, you can look at that as simply being human and trying to engage, but it can come from being really neglected or say you were raised in a really hyper-religious household and when you go to school, you'd have to guess and guess wrong. Coming back to Ralph Wiggum from The Simpsons, like his father was the police officer and it's just like he was pretty critical of him or just kind of almost a little bit like passively disgusted with his kid. And I think that that like made, his, made Ralph Wiggum worse, the psychology of, of Ralph Wiggum. So my family growing up was super negative with each other and we were sarcastic at baseline. So with, with friends at work, I'd make some really big impulsive negative faux pas and it would create like a big loud record scratch in the room. And that was me sitting on all the noise about how my family treated each other and what was modeled for me and I was acting out from that template and in turn creating more tension in the present for myself. I tried really hard to be normal, probably like a lot of you, but the impulsive negative things I would say was my trauma noise coming out sideways. And my family connected around misery and I would impulsively do the same thing with others and they'd be like, whoa, whoa, you know, you okay, buddy? And I would impulsively take my, my family's kind of Debbie Downer vibes into the wrong places creating awkwardness, creating impulsivity. I'd also make rash, impulsive decisions that the person I was dating was no longer a good person when that probably wasn't true. Or jobs, like I moved through a lot of restaurant jobs for feeling super offended and I would abruptly decide to leave. Was that just general ADHD or was that childhood trauma noise as impulsive self-protection? or magical thinking that would often come up at the slightest feeling of being disrespected. Um, we can be incredibly impulsive when we feel like things are personal. And trauma, the thing about trauma noise is that growing up, it was very personal. Um, but we now have a noisy sensitivity to it. Lastly, I haven't met a trauma survivor yet that wasn't either hypo-internal motored or hyper-internal motored. Fidgeting, rushing, not comfortable with rest at all and impulsively keeping busy or distracted. Um, that's usually in like a norm from our clients or they're massively shut down and sort of the opposite of that. It's almost the same thing. We're sitting on a lot. And perhaps the busyness is an attempt to not feel the well of trauma emotions such as shame or not good enough in the subconscious noise about what our abusive family did to us as children. Moving on to number four is low frustration tolerance. Related to impulsivity, low frustration tolerance is really hard and it's hard to live in. Um, if not related to childhood trauma history, low frustration tolerance can definitely be a part of ADHD. It can come from lack of not being able to focus or being hyper-focused on one thing and neglecting others or being pulled away from something that's actually enjoyable can be related to a, a cumulative exhaustion and struggling or trying to just get through something as simple as the morning time. Um, it can be for lack of sleep, personal shame about other ADHD symptoms and now manifesting in some kind of F my life kind of vibe. ADHD is brutal to navigate and deal with without help. How could that maybe be related to the childhood trauma piece or the childhood trauma noise. We could be raised with parents with low frustration tolerance. Raise your hand out there if your parents can't handle things like traffic or disagreements or, or directions um, or who, who grew up in an angry, unhappy household and the modeling is like, this is our lot in life. Did your parents take things personally? And that's what was modeled. Chances are with toxic family systems, like I said, it was always personal, which greatly 
lowers our risk for frustration um, or lowers our tolerance for, for frustration. There's often a reserve of very valid rage about what took place in our childhoods, but it doesn't belong in the present. And that noise can manifest with speaking, say, to the cable company or dealing with a bureau bureaucracy in some way. And of course, dealing with the cable company is frustrating to everyone. But does it hit kind of a rage button in you about being manipulated? about being marginalized, about things being massively unfair, that it being only beneficial to one side of the party, um, the cable company. <laughs> did the family that you grew up in have special rules or did they keep moving the goal line on you? Was the family you grew up in extremely unfair and lacked any sense of balance or justice? It can really come from just constantly being dismissed or put into unsafe situations, or in my case, um, constantly being made to jump through hoops. At the start of my trauma treatment saying I had low frustration tolerance was generous. I felt like filling out forms or multi-step processes like applying for college were unnecessary gatekeeping to me. Like we can often feel like the world is purposely making things harder on us. And I'm not saying the world doesn't do that to us at times, but I was completely unaware that my rage was coming from that my abusive father did a lot of that kind of thing to us, making us jump through hoops growing up. For us to get our basic needs met, he would make you work for it as a way to look superior to you and have control over you. If I needed lunch money or a permission slip signed and my mother wasn't around, I would have to go through the ordeal um, that was him. And then he'd act like he did you a favor by signing the slip or giving a little mess, you know. Raise your hand out there if you relate to that. Um, the trauma noise itself is sitting on all that happened to us can make us very negative and easily frustrated. It's also hard to see others kind of like glide through life when it feels like you have to work four times as hard to get to the same place that they do. I think I felt a lot of that growing up. My frustration tolerance was also wrapped up in a trauma narrative around the noise of fairness. I felt like others had it much easier, which made me act out in a bit kind of like secretly entitled way. That was also modeled for me by my parents. They were like that as well. Um, my mother would feel like she had the world against her if we got to a store right at closing and she'd act like the world did that to her on purpose without seeing that it was more about her disorganization or her drinking or her poor planning um, than it was about the store making special rules or something because the hours were clearly outlined on the store door um, and she would never take that in. So low frustration tolerance as trauma noise can also be rooted in feeling like you're just treading water in life or you're doing your best to seem normal as you can and something pushes you under or something impul like impulsive happens and others point out to you that you don't have it as together as you try to seem like you do. Like say at work you're already emotionally taxed at baseline and then they want to do a meeting with you or do a performance review. And the noise at baseline makes life harder and now something more is being piled on. And I'm not just counting the job could be toxic or unrealistic expectations, like that's not the point. Or I often have clients get deeply triggered, this is really specific, when their trauma pops up despite the fact that they put most of their energy into doing the best that they can. And it feels like the world is saying that your survival strategy isn't good enough. It can really piss you off because just like our families, the noise is about us feeling or saying to our boss or to our partner, like we would express to them when this comes up, like you have no idea the energy that I put into just making it and now you want to have a meeting with me. So that's what I mean about low frustration. But that vibe really isn't good for us. It's a bit, it's really kind of a self-righteous vibe and it's still noise of growing up without a safe home base to be just human. Um, and the noise of having to make it on our own as children without any help. That's where that you have no idea stuff comes from. It's not so much about the present, but again, that noise comes out sideways and you find yourself, might you might find yourself breaking down or having really hit a tipping point in those kind of situations and our frustration is through the roof. So last thought on low frustration tolerance is many trauma survivors live in conditioned upset or even have an addiction to upset as a way to confirm that nothing works in the present. It's odd, but we can actually get a little bit of a hit from being really, really pissed off or self-righteous or going to that F my life kind of a place. And again, I'm not trying to blame the survivor. A lot of that stuff is modeled for us. But in a way, if you live in upset, 
just be curious about that. Curious about well, does any part of it almost, do you get something out of it? So take that for what it is. So what to do with all this? I think getting treatment for ADHD symptoms is going to be helpful either way, I think, trauma or ADHD. But if you relate to this idea of trauma noise that we're sitting on, conscious or not, I think processing our childhood trauma is going to help, if you want that, with lessening the noise and coming back to our bodies to live presently in a less disorganized and reactive way. And I'd recommend a bunch of stuff. The most acceptable treatment being EMDR, which helps, I think it helps create space for new beliefs and hopefully processing the old noise. Um, I've done it myself, it's very, very helpful, really, really good. I was, but in another way earlier, I was able to drain all, most of my trauma noise by going to a, a trauma group where we did intimacy work, rage work, finishing business with our families, holding them accountable metaphorically, not in person, doing empty chair work, experiential work, and doing that with others who are on the same path and that they, they were safe. Finding all that I know is incredibly hard and I'm just saying that's how I did it, but there are some therapies out there that can help help you shift out of the noise and become a little bit more, but just make sure that it's trauma-focused work with a trauma-focused therapist. And I can definitely do a whole video on that uh, at, a, at a different time. Lastly, trauma noise is there for good reason. It's like an intense unfinished movie that you never got closure on, and it's there in the background sort of asking to be addressed if you choose to. Um, it can simply be the grief and loss of family normalcy or not being connected with your family. My experience was once I processed and did deeper work, um, like I mentioned with meditation earlier, those chapters in my life got resolved, got closed, and it didn't come up in tense moments or randomly anymore. Here's an exercise though that I can offer that you can do about some looking at some personal examples of the trauma noise you experience. It's kind of a list exercise. You create three columns for three separate lists. Um, the first is systemic trauma noise. This is hard to come up with, but you can refer to something like my seven types of toxic family systems. By systemic, I mean how your family system operated. Things like aggressor codependent, triangulation, looks good on paper, superior inferior relationships or parental attitudes, passive aggression, religion before reality, protect the most abusive person, all of that stuff is like, you know, system issues. And here I've given three examples of systemic issues, like the toxic divorce with the ships in the night thing, poor parental boundaries and filter and say something like basic as how the family communicated. Next is you, you draw a correlation to some concrete memories. I would actually start here and then work from the left column to the right and notice how each item is related to each other from left to right. Concrete memories is the stuff that keeps coming up for you or things that stick out in your mind, like that time on vacation where mom lost it, Christmas 97, stuff that was said to you. These were actually clues at the time that you remember, but they were clues about that you actually weren't safe and it had gone off the rails. The last column is relating your present trauma noise. It's like your triggers. It can be anything that you get dysregulated around feedback, that you worry your partner will leave or is cheating and that you overshare or you over explain. And the exercise is about connecting the dots. The noise is there for good reasons and it's not what you would have chosen if given the choice. If you get stuck in one column, try starting with another and almost work with it like a crossword puzzle. See if that helps making your trauma noise clearer. It's not going to make it go away, but for you to be on top of it and know where it's coming from is a step to eventually making it going away. This requires some thinking and you can use my videos to research or look for other concepts um, through the videos. I recently put together a playlist that has like a succession of all these videos and you can check that out too. So I hope this very long video was helpful to you. Um, you can go check out the original video on ADHD versus CPTSD to, to check that out and use that for a reference as well. You can also go through a list of, there's a video on journaling prompts that might get you to think about this stuff or get to know your triggers. They all have a general theme to them about exploring childhood that's in a playlist that I've recently created. I'll also have that in the link in the description. And I hope it was helpful to you. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on trauma noise, what you think about it. I would love to hear questions in the comments. And as always, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. And may you be joyous. And I will see you next time.